Good morning, church. It is so good to be back with you for another week of our online church service. And we're glad to have you here. And if you're new for the first time, welcome. And I pray that you woke up, as I will say often, and uh, borrowing from Psalm 118 and verse 24, that you have given thanks and you're rejoicing. You're being glad in this day that the Lord has made. Even in the midst of sadness or heartbreak or trouble or struggles or anything else that life will oftentimes send your way, I pray you're rejoicing in this day the Lord has made. There's an old uh, proverbial saying, so I'm told, that gets used a lot when something bad happens in life and then it's followed by something else even worse that happens in life. And then it's followed by even more bad things. And and maybe you'll follow along here from where you're watching to help me finish this proverbial saying as it's presented. It says, you know what? When it rains, it pours. I'd imagine most of us could relate to that saying in one way or another at different times in our lives and maybe currently. I've thought a lot about that saying since this month of August began. Uh, On the last Friday of July, actually, I got a call from my youngest brother uh, to let me know that they had noticed a little bit of a change in his wife, my sister-in-law, who we've been praying for diligently over the past 15 months or so in her fierce battle uh, with brain cancer. But he said, listen, They just noticed the thing, so they figured they might as well at least contact hospice and and get the process started. And so I was thankful that he gave us the update. And and my wife, Trisha, and I shed some tears and thinking that perhaps the miracle that we had all been praying for for so long maybe uh, was not actually going to happen this time. And so uh, we began praying for what lied ahead for uh, uh, my sister-in-law with this a journey, especially from the ones we've experienced through the years of our loved ones and friends in the same kind of a battle, uh, that that last journey can be uh, quite uh, brutal. And uh, Trisha and I had made some plans. Maybe we'd, uh, we were going to New Mexico uh, just to kind of catch our breaths for a week. And uh, we had that in the works. So we said, all right, well, we'll keep those and then we'll come back and we'll uh, make some trips down there and get some things uh, started for uh, my brother and his family, and Tracy, our sister-in-law. And, but two days later, August 1st, on a Sunday, uh, another one of my brothers called early Sunday morning to say that Tracy had passed away in the middle of the night. And I was asked if I would be able to maybe officiate the funeral. And so with that news to start a Sunday morning early, I, I immediately went into what we call preacher's mode, uh, to get everything kind of in, in order and under control to say, all right, I'm going to put all the grief and all the shock of this off to the side and focus now on, on what needs to be done in preparations for uh, this upcoming funeral and everything. And so uh, we decided, we, we told the elders of the situation, and of course they said, listen, you don't need to come in. I said, no, I've got things ready. Uh, for this Sunday here. I've been prepared and I'm in preacher's mode. So uh, we put that aside and came in to to worship with the congregation here at Tri-Lakes Church. And and while we were here, we had an interesting thing, a wonderful thing happened. There was a family uh, that we knew for 18 years when we administered in in Burlington before we came to Monument. And in fact, uh, their daughter uh, was getting married that afternoon. Uh, and uh, he's an elder at the church out there in Burlington. And, and so they uh, called the, the mother of the bride, whom we know, they called and said, you know, we've got these flowers. Originally, they had planned a wedding in Ireland, and that got canceled because of COVID. And so they moved it to Colorado Springs, and, and they had all these flowers in bulk that they needed to assemble into vases and stuff. And she just said, I, I don't know if you've got anything, but... Would you have a room or something available that maybe we could bring those so that we can kind of put them all together? And so we said, absolutely. You come on up and and you can have anything here. We'll help you out any way we can. And so they were here early that Sunday morning and putting the flowers and things together. And it was then that we met the father of the groom. Uh, His name was Terry, and and he instantly made such an impression on us in our office while we were getting ready for the Sunday service and still 
been working through the news of my sister-in-law passing away, but you know, this, this man was just so over, overwhelmingly grateful uh, and so kind in his words of how, how thankful they were that we would open up uh, our place and allow them to come in. And we said, please, we love this whole family and it's a great day of celebration. Uh, and so we had that going on and we went home after services and they had their wedding that afternoon. And uh, uh, the Monday morning came, August 2nd, and I was notified that a preacher friend of mine that I'd known for seven years. He was part of our group here in Monument. We get together uh, once a month with all the surrounding preachers and and we discuss with each other uh, things happening in the community, maybe opportunities we can use to, to serve in the community and then pray for each other. And I got notified that this you know, much younger than me minister had been on a trip somewhere and had gotten sick and had passed away. And I thought, wow, okay, well, I'm going to have to put that aside for just a little bit and stay in this preacher mode and, and got through that week of a couple of trips to Eads where my brother and his family lived and uh, made the arrangements and officiated at the funeral that Friday, August 6th. And it was at that funeral that uh, I was told that, that our oldest brother, he's a year and a half older than me, uh, that he wasn't going to be able to come. He was home and was battling COVID. And so we had that going on, but they said that uh, I was told that he was on the mend. He had been battling it for over a week or so, and uh, that he was on the mend, and so that he just didn't want to come with the exposure and all that stuff. So, okay, perfectly understandable. So we finished the, uh, the funeral service for my uh, sister-in-law. We made our way back. My youngest son, Caleb, and his wife from Omaha had driven out, so they were going to come and stay with us for at least a couple of days before they headed back. Uh, so that Sunday, we actually gathered, we stayed at home and joined the online church service on August the 8th. And, and while we were there, we got the news uh, that Terry, the, the, the father of the groom that we had met just seven days earlier, and that he had had a heart attack and that he had passed away. And so that hit, and we had to kind of work through that a little bit. And I told the, the kids, I said, hey, tomorrow, Monday morning, August 9th, we're going to go out and do some afing, adventures in food. And we started this when they were just young ones. We'd go to a city and drive through all the different fast food drive throughs and just pick one or two items from every place and split it up. And we'd have an adventure in food. I said, we're going to do some of that. So Monday, August 9th, we headed out, and while they were in uh, one of the, the places getting some of the food we had ordered to bring back home to eat, I got a call from my youngest brother, who I was just with three days earlier at the funeral of his wife, my sister-in-law, and, and he just said, Greg, I got some bad news. We, we lost our brother. And I said, well, you, we lost our brother? And he said, yeah, my oldest brother had passed away uh, from, as a result of, he believes, a blood clot that went to his lungs from covid and so began that process and asked if I might be able to officiate the funeral. And so working through that in Goodland, Kansas, uh, he was a veterinarian there and uh, had the funeral Friday, August 13th. Uh, and, and Trish and I, we got back home and my youngest son and his wife headed back to Omaha. And uh, Trish and I just basically collapsed in our chairs in our living room and wanted to shut all the phones off, pull the curtains, lock the doors, don't talk to anybody, uh, and just see if we can make through a day without some tragedy uh, being uh, given to us through the news. And I got to thinking of that saying through the funerals and through different conversations. Uh, so many people in offering some encouragement and condolences would come and talk about that proverbial saying. You, you know, Greg, that old proverbial saying, uh, when it rains, it pours. And I thought, wow, that, that kind of makes a lot of sense with everything that's going on lately and since this month started. And, uh, and I got to thinking more and more about that and came to the conclusion, you know, I've got an idea for the sermon that I'd like to preach uh, the next Sunday when I'm back, which is now. And uh, the title for the message that I pray we grow in our understanding of this morning, I said, if this keeps up, I just say, Lord, I need a bigger umbrella. I'm going to need a bigger umbrella. Uh, I can't help but think of Job. 
the story of Job in scriptures and wonder how big of an umbrella did Job need with all that he went through? If, if this, when it rains, it pours, this proverbial saying is true. I mean, think about the rain. Think about it, Job losing his livestock and losing his servants and losing his sons and his daughters and, and losing his health. So many things. How did he ever process that? Being bombarded with event after event, with tragedy after tragedy. And, and I'm just thinking, there's no record of any particular conversation uh, revealing this proverbial saying. But I say, what a perfect opportunity for someone to come and try to offer him encouragement and say, well, you know, Job, uh, when it rains, it, it pours. And so and we're going to dig deeper into Job's story this morning. Because I believe if we dig deeper, we're going to find the very foundation, the very core, if you will, of what I pray we're going to grow in our understanding of this morning. There's only two verses to, to highlight, underline, and circle. So if you get your Bible out and turn to the, the first chapter of Job, and we're going to see as it unfolds a very familiar story. We're not going to spend a lot of time in it, but and the Lord and, and the Satan gets into a conversation, and, and the Lord brings up Job, and he says he's blameless, he's upright, he, he fears me, and he shuns evil. And then you find if you go down into uh, verse 10, it says that the saints and he lodges a complaint and with the Lord he says have you not put a hedge around Job and his household and everything that he has and the answer is yes that in fact God had put a protective hedge around Job because Satan lays down the challenge he says hey you take the hedge away and you watch what happens Job will curse you to your face and so the Lord says done meaning what meaning that protective hedge is going to come down with some stipulations God says all right it's coming down but I, I'm not going to allow you to to uh, kill him okay <laughs> so the deal is on and <clears throat> Job is is being attacked uh, in so many ways and we see the details of that when that hedge is removed and 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 the folks today that would say when when the rains begin and come down as that proverbial saying goes it would be a perfect opportunity with Job to say you know Job when it rains it pours and we know what happens. His servants, dead. His livestock, dead and taken away. His, his sons and daughters, dead. His health is dead. Uh, everything is gone. And now what? As we read this story, we find out that there is Job, and he's going to cry out, and there will be questions, and there will be accusations, and there will be complaints. But then comes the end of this story. And your Bible's in Job chapter 42. What I call the end of God's lesson for Job. And Job is going to say to the Lord, he's going to say, Lord, I know you can do all things. No plan of yours can be stopped. No plan of yours can be defeated. And then in verse 3, Job is going to say, Lord, I... I spoke of things that I did not understand. God, I spoke of things that are too wonderful for me to know. And then my most favorite part of the entire story in Job chapter 42, here's your second highlight, underline, and circle moment. Job tells the Lord in verse 5, he says, My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself. And I repent in dust and ashes. And so when the, the smoke finally cleared in this incredible story that some people have great difficulty, the scholars and the deep thinkers will debate back and forth if it was real or a, a, just a parable or what it might be. Either way, when the smoke finally cleared and Job was able to see clearly what God had been doing, he said, Lord, I'm sorry. He says, I repent. I had the wrong perspective of what you were doing. And in that is, is he proclaimed that he spoke of things too wonderful for him to know. What's he saying? He's saying basically, Lord, thank you for helping me to see you at work in my life. Thank you for correcting my wrong perspective. 
And by the way, that word that's used to describe that process of correcting is discipline. Discipline. Not in the way of punishment, but in the way of correcting, of correcting wrong perspectives, correcting wrong decisions. We use it, discipline, when we discipline our children. When they make wrong decisions or have wrong ideas or perspectives, what do we do? We discipline them. We correct them so that they can get back and stay on the right path. God was disciplining Job in his wrong perspectives. All that Job thought he knew, God was revealing to him in a very powerful way. Job, you've got the wrong perspective. And in the end, Job is going to acknowledge it, and he's going to say, I repent. I changed my mind on what I thought was right. I'm coming back. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for my wrong perspectives on what I was going through in my life. Thank you, Lord, for helping me to see you in a much more powerful way. And then to say, he says, oh, I, I definitely had heard of you, Lord. I've, I heard with my ears. I heard all about you. But now, through this process, I can see you with my eyes. Thank you for correcting my wrong perspective on what was going on in my life. Here's our so what this morning. A few questions for each of us to consider. What is your perspective? of all of life's troubles when they happen to you. Perhaps currently you're under attack with some challenges and some struggles and some loss and some tragedy, or maybe you've come through that, or maybe you're about to come through. What's your perspective of all of life's troubles when they happen? Do you think of the the proverbial saying as it's presented? Well, you know, when it rains, it pours. Do you cry out to God, maybe like Job, with all your questions, maybe a few accusations, maybe sprinkled with quite a few complaints? And of all things, I pray in in our so what portion to finish the message this morning that you will get this part. Whatever your perspective is when life's troubles come your way, it is your perspective of all of life's troubles as they happen to you and around you, that is going to determine, it's one of the most important things that will determine how or if you will get through it when you face those situations in your life. So then I've got another question coming from the story of Job and leaning toward this proverbial saying of when it rains, it pours. I wonder, do you believe that you have a hedge of protection around you from God. And I would just ask, if not, then why are you still here? When you read the story of Job, did you see what happened when the hedge of protection came down? All of Job's kids were killed. It doesn't mean you're not going to suffer from many things just like everybody else in life, but is there a hedge of protection around you? Here's our homework assignment. Get a piece of paper because I believe this affects your perspective and my perspective of life when bad things happen to good people. Here's the question. Get a piece of paper and make a list for yourself. I want you to, to think about the history in God's story of how it all began from the garden in perfection with God and his creation, and sin ruining that. And so God, in his wrath, makes a decision that he will destroy this world, that he created for good, but it's cursed because of sin. So the question, I want you to make a list. How would you describe life in a world that's been cursed by God because of sin? How would a cursed life look? How would relationships be? How would your health be? How about tragedies and suffering? How would it look in a world that's been cursed because of sin? For so many years, I confess, I had the wrong perspective of of what life is supposed to look like once we became Christians. I, I, as believers in God, to know that God has all power, all control, all authority. So when we give our lives to him, or as I believed, 
then God should protect me. There should be no tragedies, no suffering. And I'm sure you realize what I did at the time. That's a wrong perspective. And in my life, God had to discipline me. God had to correct my wrong perspectives about life in this world. And not asking the question, why do, do bad things happen to good people? But the more important question, why do good things happen to good people? It's been cursed, this world. So God, how did God correct me? How did God discipline me? Well, by my, my life and the sufferings and the tragedy, tragedy after tragedy that I would go through. And with his word revealing what he specifically told me from the very beginning, I just never paid attention to it, specifically telling me that this world has been cursed because of sin. It wasn't how I made it to be. I made it to be perfect, but sin ruined that. I should have destroyed it. I was so mad, but I didn't. I made a way by sending my son to give his life by which all creation could now choose. Do you want to be with me in heaven forever? If so, understand that's possible now because of the sacrifice of my son, but understand you're going to suffer through this life on your way to be with me. And when we think of that as, as God has restored the possibility for us to be in relationship, he tells us firsthand, we, 1 Peter 1, 6, yes, we greatly rejoice in that truth. But for now, he tells us, but listen, never forget, for a little while, we will suffer grief in all kinds of trials, in all kinds of suffering as we live our lives in this world. The world of darkness, because it's been cursed by sin. And there's that word, grief. We're going to suffer grief in all kinds of trials and sufferings and grief, which I got to use way too many times in the last couple of weeks, at least at funerals at, from 1 Thessalonians 4.13. We know we're going to grieve. We're no different than the world when they lose loved ones and the likes. We're going to grieve, but we don't grieve like the world because the world has no hope. I didn't describe, by the way, all the things at the beginning of our message this morning. I didn't do that uh, for me and, and my family and kind of the things happening to us since this month of August began. I didn't do that to, to, to win a prize uh, for the when it rains, it pours competition. It seems like when tragedies hit, sometimes people like to make it a competition on who's suffering the most. I don't want any part of that. I said I, I didn't describe all those things that have happened so far. In August, and I myself highlight, underline, and circle the so far part because there's still many days left here, halfway at least through August. I shared the details of what was happening to us so that I could get to the so what this morning that I pray we grow in our understanding of as a family. I came to give all glory and all honor and praise to the God who has placed a protective hedge around me. Yes, I look around and I see the tragedy and the devastation, but I say, Lord, if it wasn't for your protective hedge, what would it be like? Imagine. Can you imagine life with no protective hedge? Read Job. And we're devastated and we grieve and we mourn and we groan through life in this world of darkness. But God is in absolute, complete control. Not Satan. Jesus himself will be the one, if you remember, and he's talking to God's people in John chapter 10. And he goes on to say, I'm, a, I'm your shepherd, and you know my voice. I know you. And he says, I'm going to give you eternal life. You'll never perish, and no one, he says, no one can snatch you out of my hand. I thank God for his protective hedge around me. And I acknowledge that every time anything bad happens, I give thanks to say, God, I, I, this, I know you're going to help me through this, but I thank you for the protective hedge. I can't imagine life without you helping me with your protective hedge. Another question uh, before we're done here. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11 through 12 tells us that, that God loves us and that, that God disciplines those he loves. So the question is, do you believe God loves you? All right. Well, if so, here's another homework assignment for you. Oh, you're getting a lot. I'm trying to catch up with being gone for a week. 
homework assignment is God loves you, and Scripture tells us clearly God disciplines those he loves. So the question, how has God disciplined you lately? I say, listen, do you, do you believe that God disciplines those he loves? Yes. Does he love you? Yes. Can you tell me, how has he disciplined you lately? Can we have that conversation and share stories so I understand how is it that God disciplines, how God corrects? When you think of that, I'd like for you to get your list and fill that list out. How has God disciplined you lately? In what ways? For me, I, I would share with you, He has definitely corrected me, and especially in my when it rains, it pours perspective. In fact, uh, before we're done here, can I just say with just a little more digging, let me ask a question on that old proverbial saying as it's presented. Where did that saying, when it rains, it pours, you know, when did that, where did that saying come from? When it rains, it pours. Well, it's presented usually by, it was proverbial, so I said, well, it's got to be in Proverbs, right? If it's proverbial, well, good luck. It's not in Proverbs anywhere. Well, it's got to be somewhere in, in Scripture. No, no. In fact, maybe you already know, but for those that don't, I'll just help you here quickly. You want to know where the saying, that old proverbial saying, when it rains, it pours, where it came from? Try the Morton Salt Company. That's where the saying came from. It's been approximately 107 years ago. It's all about salt. And maybe if you know anything about salt, you know that when the humidity is high, especially like when it rains, that salt has the tendency to clump together, uh, to become very hard, and you've got to hammer it to, to split it back up so it will shake out of a salt shaker. And so the Morton Company over 107 years ago, came up with this idea that says, you know, we can come up with a special additive that they put in their salt. And with it, they created a, a new container with a pour spout on it. And the big advertising campaign with the slogan, are you ready? When it rains, it pours. Well, what pours? Their salt. I, I, I went and I thought, man, is this... Is this true? I went to our spice cabinet, even at my house, uh, with, uh, without my executive producer of video productions, stage prop manager, uh, slash secretary, slash my wife knowing, but I promise I'm, I'm going to put it back. But I grabbed one, and maybe you have one of these in yours. I'm going to come up here a little bit and just see. It's the Morton salt container. And on that label, it has a picture of a girl with the umbrella in a rainstorm. And under her arm, she's holding the container of Morton salt. And in this pour spout is open and it's pouring salt out behind her. Why? Because when it rains, it pours. And understand that some 107 years ago, when they first started that campaign, when people would hear that, they would celebrate. They would maybe jump up and down and say, how awesome. No more clumping of salt because everybody knows how much we hate salt when it clumps together. And now, even when it rains, it pours. There's the, the, the history. There is the origin of the saying. So they celebrated when they heard, when it rains, it pours. Well, what's happened through all these years that now it's become the most negative, terrible thing? Well, you know, it will tragedy after tragedy. And what's that old proverbial saying? Well, you know what they say. When it rains, it pours. And shouldn't we answer, why are you talking about salt? That's what the context, context, context is of that saying. It's about salt. Why did it turn so negative? And I'll tell you, you should know the answer. Are there people involved? Why something so positive being turned into something so negative? And, and by the way, even let's put all that aside and say, actually, let's talk about when it rains, it pours from God's perspective. Rain is a very positive thing with God. 
I mean, how dare we take rain and put it to such a negative thing? Morton Salt didn't do that. They put it in the most positive way. When it rains, it pours. Their salt still pours. And people celebrated. What about us with rain and God? E Ezekiel 34, uh, the prophecy is given. Uh, and the prophecy is revealing that the Lord is coming, is going to rescue his sheep, his people. And actually, he's going to place a shepherd over them. And it will be David who will be their shepherd. And most importantly, in Ezekiel 34 and verse 26, it says, the Lord, the Lord says, I will bless them and the places surrounding my hill. How much so, Lord? How are you going to bless them? I will send down showers in season. There will be showers of blessing. So now I tell you the challenge that I bring and the encouragement that I pray we grow in our understanding of. In the beginning, when I use the current events in our life, I know this. There are so many others that have so many other stories of tragedies and loss. It's not about all of that. It's about being able to see the blessings, the showers of blessings. And that's why when I gave the title, Lord, I need a bigger umbrella, it wasn't because of a downpour or the onslaught of tragedies and losses. It was because of the identification of the blessings that I've learned that God has disciplined me to help me see are being poured down on me on a daily basis. What's your perspective on all of life's troubles when they happen to you? Do you give thanks for God's hedge of protection around you? Do you know what that even means and what it looks like? Have you given your life to God? Have you surrendered your life? Have you said, listen, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for trying to think that I could manage and be in charge of my life all by myself. Lord, I repent in dust and ashes and I need you. I give my life to you. I believe in your son, Jesus. I need him as my savior. I know he died for me. And I know you raised him from the dead. Have you repented and confessed that and been immersed in the waters of baptism to receive his gift of the Holy Spirit? Walking your way and navigating your way through life with God in charge. Have you done that? I pray that you're all giving thanks and rejoicing and so many things, the showers of blessings, even in the midst of tragedies and loss and heartache. I pray you're giving thanks and rejoicing in God's hedge of protection that he's placed around you. I pray that you're rejoicing and celebrating that God does in fact love you and he disciplines those he loves. And I pray that you're paying attention to his lessons. Class is always in session with God, always something new to learn that draws us closer to God in our relationship with him. And I pray that you're rejoicing and celebrating in the midst of your journey, whatever it means to you right now and what you're going through. I pray you're celebrating and giving thanks for God's promises to you that he will be with you every step of the way, all the way to be with him for all eternity when you finish your race through your journey through this world of darkness. Until next time, keep the faith.